Good afternoon. I have absolutely no idea how I follow that last video. Um, basically, I know that the idea behind TED is that I'm supposed to present to you an original and inspiring idea. That said, I work in politics. So what I've decided to do is find an idea that worked in the past, repackage it slightly, and present it back to you as an original and inspiring idea. Uh, so what is that idea? By the end of this talk, I hope that I will have persuaded you all that you either are already or that you should be 21st century suffragettes. It's pretty much the uh, reaction that I was expecting. Um, now, obviously, I can see why you might be slightly hesitant. Why would you want to join a movement that had effectively put itself out of business when women got the vote on equal terms with men in 1928? Um, well, I'm going to argue that actually the suffrage movement was always about more than just winning the vote. Yes, it was about winning equal opportunity to vote, but it was also about winning equal opportunity to stand for election, and I would argue, by extension, equal, op equal representation in Parliament. And I think on all three measures, we actually still have quite a long way to go. Firstly, in order to get you to join my movement, I have to convince you that it matters. And to do that, I'm going to use a very blunt instrument, which is a, an anecdote from a book called Half the Sky, uh, which some of you may have read. And if you have, you'll probably have been struck um, by the statistic that in the First World War, more American women died in childbirth than American soldiers died on the front line. That's an absolutely staggering statistic. And obviously, is a remnant of a past that we wouldn't return to. That's a reality that we just wouldn't accept today. So what changed? Well, obviously, after the First World War, women got the vote. And politicians suddenly realized that if they wanted to get elected, they would have to court that vote. And they brought in a whole raft of measures that improved maternal mortality rates for women in the US. Having the vote can save your life. And I would argue that matters. Um, now, obviously, all the way through this, I'm going to be talking about women's issues, issues like maternal mortality. But you and I both know that these are not women's issues. These are issues that are felt most acutely by women, but issues that have a chronic impact on society. And the best politicians recognize that women's issues are not women's issues. They are society's issues, but they are issues that are felt more acutely by women. Domestic violence, for example, a third of women in the UK uh, will acutely feel the effects of domestic violence. But there is a much larger societal impact, which it is the responsibility of our politicians uh, to address. OK, so basically, having the vote makes politicians notice you. Um, and that is very important. For, as women, we find it difficult to exert political influence in other ways. 24% of the people that you see in the media or read about in the media are women. So we don't have that big media presence. Uh, one in 10 of the Times Rich List last year were women. We can't buy our influence. Um, but also, we are less likely to do that other old favorite, withdrawing our labor and going on strike. We are still overrepresented in uh, professions like nursing, caring, and obviously childcare. Uh, professions from which we would not withdraw our labor because of the impact that that, that would have um, on those people that you're working with. We know that in London, the average salary of a carer is half the average salary of a tube driver. But you aren't going to get a massive walk out of carers. It's in the job description. It's just not going to happen. So the vote really matters if you're a woman. Um, now, quick clarification. I am not suggesting at any point that men cannot represent women in politics. There are some amazing men in Parliament that do just that. They recognize that women's issues are their issues and society's issues, and they champion them extremely well. I would call each and every one of those men a suffragette, and I would be very proud to march with them uh, any day of the year. But I think there's a more interesting uh, dynamic going on. Um, the Fawcett Society, before the last election, uh, did a survey of parliamentary candidates. And they asked them whether, if elected, they would do three things. Firstly, um, whether they would do something to tackle the gender pay gap. Secondly, whether they would do something to uh, provide more support for victims of sexual violence, and whether they would push for stronger conviction rates for rape. Uh, the last thing they asked them to do was to pledge that, if elected, they would push for the Treasury to do an impact assessment of the impact that any spending cuts would have on women. Not that they would change anything about those spending cuts, just that they would do an assessment of the impact that they would have on women. 18% of candidates responded. And obviously, you and I know that many fewer candidates were female than male. But over half of the candidates that responded saying that they would do these things were female. Now, looking at that, it's very easy to say, well, that clearly means that men are less likely to care about these issues. Men don't care. But I'd say, actually, 
there's something much more fundamental and much more interesting go that's going on, which really speaks to the importance of representation in Parliament. And that is, um, I believe that women were just more likely, when they received that email, to feel a connection with the issue, and they were more likely to want to just take the few minutes it took to respond. Uh, they felt a personal connection, and they responded accordingly. Um, so it's not that men didn't care, it's just that they didn't perhaps feel that attachment and didn't feel compelled in the same way to respond. Uh, it's interesting to me, one of the largest special interest groups in Parliament is the all-party parliamentary group for football. One of the smallest is the all-party parliamentary group for women, peace and security. I don't believe there's a single man in Parliament that would tell you that he thought football was more important than women in conflict. They know that it's more important. But the thing is, when you become an MP, you decide the things that you're going to prioritise. And then you give a little bit of your time to a few other issues. Um, and so they were more likely to sign up to something that they were personally interested in, uh, which was football, and they added themselves onto that mailing list. But of course, cumulatively, the effect is that then you have a lot more parliamentarians who on a regular basis receive a little bit of information about football and who might be asked to do something about it, and fewer politicians who are asked to do something about women in conflict. Um, so we all know that the more interest a cause generates, the more likely it is to succeed. Women are more likely to be interested in women's issues, and that's why, currently, we do need them representing us in Parliament. So, how is the campaign going so far? How is our suffrage campaign proceeding? On the first measure, do we have equal opportunity to vote? Ostensibly, yes, we do. You know, we can all go to the ballot box and we can all put a cross by the uh, name of our preferred candidate. That said, obviously in politics, votes happen at all sorts of different levels. Arguably, the most powerful vote in the land is held by members of the cabinet. Currently, 19 of those votes are held by men and four of them by women. Also, there's the casting vote, the one that we give to our prime minister. Since 1928, we've given that vote to 16 people, one of whom has been a woman. That's going to matter. Also, as women, we don't obviously all exercise our vote equally. Um, I've speak, spoken to women who basically tell me that they view their vote as an obligation rather than a privilege. Uh, it's something they actually in some ways wish they didn't have to do. Um, but I, also, I would argue that still in the UK, whether you feel able to freely exercise your vote still depends very much on who you are and where you come from. Um, I had a very eye-opening experience at the 2005 general election. I was telling at the polling station in a not very affluent part of East London. And as I stood there, there were obviously groups of guys who were distributing leaflets um, to people as they came to vote. Um, and women were coming to the polling station, but they weren't coming by themselves. By and large, they were coming with their husbands. And it was very interesting. You could watch. There was clearly an assumption on both sides that actually these women would vote in line with their husband's vote. And time and again, you'd see a woman go to take a leaflet from one of these guys, and they'd actually take it away from her and give it to a man. <laughs> Clearly, they assumed that those women weren't exercising their right to vote equally with men. And actually, what horrified me was that that party that those men represented then won that election. And I don't believe that once elected, they turned around and really started powerfully representing the women of that constituency. So still, in the UK, there are sections of the population where women feel less able to vote. And obviously, that's a global problem. Um, that idea of one household, one vote is actually enshrined in law in some countries. In other countries, women have to prove they have an elementary education before they can vote, whereas men can vote freely. Um, some countries make it very, very simple and just withhold the vote from women altogether. At least you know where you stand in that sort of regime. But ultimately, that will impact on everybody in this room. Um, for a start, because we're human beings and we care, when you hear that the biggest killer of teenage girls in the world today is pregnancy and childbirth. It's hard not to think back to the American women of World War I and think that actually perhaps political empowerment might be part of the solution um, to that problem. But also we live in a globalized world. Increasingly the world is getting smaller. If we want to compete for jobs where um, we are expected to travel and work with colleagues from other nations, increasingly our freedoms will be global freedoms rather than just freedoms in the UK. Second measure. Do we in the UK have equal opportunity to stand for election? Well, the bad news is one in five candidates at the last general election were women. The good news is that of, of the candidates elected, one in five were women. So clearly the electorate have no problem with women. Uh, the electorate are fully prepared to elevate women to positions of power. Um, and obviously it looks like on the surface we do have 
equal opportunity to stand for election. But of course, that isn't the full picture. Currently, predominantly, the selection boards for candidates are still predominantly male. Um, they are still the gatekeepers for women's politics. But we also know that it takes more than talent um, and the intent to become an MP. You have to have a number of other things. For example, you have to have connections, the right connections built up usually over a lifetime. You have to have a fairly solid financial base to fall back on. And you have to have lots and lots of time. I had friends at the last election who literally quit their jobs for months on end, moved halfway across the other side of the country, and all to run elections in seats that they knew they weren't going to win. The object being to demonstrate that they could make an impact in seats that were unwinnable, so the next time round, in five years' time, they could then stand in a winnable seat. Um, so that, you have to have an awful lot of dedication and an awful lot of time. Um, the other thing is you have to have very loose ties and obligations. Um, the number one reason that men give for dropping out of local government is that they need more time to devote to their careers. The number one reason women give is that they need more time to spend with their families. And I'd say that actually, if you're looking at that as a straightforward choice, the choice between devoting more time to your career or to your family, I'd say one feels like a much easier choice than the other. Again, the good news is that these are clearly barriers that we can overcome if we want to. If you look at how we stack up in the world rankings, we are currently 73rd in the world for the proportion of females in Parliament. We are just behind Poland and the Dominican Republic. We are quite a long way behind Afghanistan. Uh, and we are streets behind the, num the one country in the world that has managed to get more women than men in Parliament. The government of Rwanda is 60% female. So it's possible. Um, and we, they obviously said it's a great example that we can work towards. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean that the women of Rwanda now have brilliant representation and there's a raft of measures that come in that mean that the world will be a much better place for Rwandan women. I'm sure it will help, and certainly over time, um, I'm sure that will happen. But I think there's, again, a really interesting power play going on uh, with women in parliament. I think women in parliament are still constrained by the fact of being a woman in parliament, which makes it harder often for them to represent us. Um, obviously, it's neither original nor inspiring to point out that the way Parliament works currently doesn't work for women. That's well documented. I won't go into it here. Um, but obviously, um, I work for an international development charity called Plan International. Um, we work predominantly on girls' education issues. I went into Parliament a few months back um, to talk to a female MP, and she absolutely agreed with everything I was saying. She had no doubt in her mind that if politicians were to do what we were asking, that the world would be a much better place. That said, she said, I will support you wholeheartedly, but please can I do it behind the scenes? I don't want my colleagues and I don't want my constituents thinking that I'm a woman that only works on women's issues. I don't want them thinking I'm a one-trick pony and buttonholing me. Um, and so I would argue that she was constrained because she was a woman and felt more visible from actually representing us and working on women's issues. And that's a terrible situation for us to be in. If the women in parliament can't represent us, um, then we have a lot more work to do. And again, I accept that the problem does lie partly with us. I am an enormous hypocrite. There's some brilliant and intelligent women in this room. I would probably quite happily, for each one of you, walk the length and breadth of Britain, knocking on doors, trying to persuade people to vote for you. That said, I wouldn't want to be the candidate myself. It doesn't look like a job that I think would be an awful lot of fun. And I've always sort of wondered about that. How can it be that there's this job that so many men that I know would really love to have, that will devote half their lives to being part of, and yet it doesn't appeal to me. Now, I've been toying with putting this in or taking this out of my speech because uh, this is a very contentious issue, but obviously uh, the idea of 21st century suffrage, I can't really not talk about all women shortlists. Um, and I do it with some trepidation because obviously on the one hand you've got people saying quite rightly, look, Look how little progress we've made over time. We've got to do something that is a catalyst that really gets women into politics, and all women shortlists can do that. On the other hand, you have people saying, well, no, uh, it should be a meritocracy. You should have people, on the basis of their individual merits, you should have the best candidate for the job, and they should always get elected. And actually, I've always gone really down the second stream. I've always sort of felt, again, as a woman in politics, you constantly wrestle with this idea of the female supremacist, the idea that actually women want more than our due, and we aren't going to stop until we get it. Um, and, you know, 
part of the problem of being a woman in politics and being a feminist, in fact, is the tedium of having to go back to basics every time and start to explain yourself in terms of, no, we just want equality. Um, so yes, looking at the issue of all women shortlists, um, I suddenly thought to myself, actually, what does the best candidate mean? For some people, that will be the most brilliant candidate. Somebody that's not actually like us, they're better. Somebody that's really, really clever, can look at problems, analyze them, and come up with solutions in ways that we just couldn't. But obviously, for other people, it's something else. It's somebody that understands us, that knows the problems we face because they face them as well, that can inspire us and lead us, and that really can represent us. So there already, you've got two totally different ideas of what the best candidate actually is. And I would argue that perhaps what we need to look at is not the best candidate, but the best candidates, and actually take a more pluralistic view. Um, and at that point, we suddenly realize that actually being female might actually be the thing that tips it over and makes you the best candidate. And at that point, then surely all women shortlists aren't a very threatening thing at all. Okay, just in summary, just to, sorry, just to end. Um, this year is a very, very exciting year. It is the 100th anniversary of International Women's Day, the 8th of March, 100 years ago, 30,000 women took to the streets of London, 30,000 people, I should say, took to the streets of London to march for women's rights and the women's rights and women's suffrage. Um, and I think it's terrible that 100 years on, for a start, those women will be horrified at how little progress we've made considering the incredible start that they gave us. Um, but also, it's terrible that we don't really know that International Women's Day is happening. If you live in China or Vietnam, you get a day's holiday. But here it goes unnoticed. We're more likely to celebrate the women in our life on Mother's Day. And I think it's actually wrong. We should start celebrating the women in our lives for who and what they are, not the contribution they've made to us, which is effectively what we're currently doing. So, International Women's Day this year, the best thing you can do, um, and the, most, the thing the suffragettes would want you to do is just to make a noise. You know, you can write to your MP and take an overtly political act. Political act. You could decide you wanted to become an MP. Um, or you can just tell all your friends about it. There's a coalition of charities that are coming together uh, with funding from Annie Lennox, and they are going to be making a noise together. And literally, anything goes. Plan, the charity I work for, is part of it, so I get to do this as a job, which is brilliant. Um, but, you know, anything goes. They are planning uh, a soul train across Westminster Bridge. You can do whatever you like. Come down and join us. Um, but, you know, the point is that we need to start making a noise, and we need to start saying, actually, International Women's Day matters to us, and suffrage matters to us as well.